Section ten of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter six B, Part two A. Enlightenment. The peculiar object on which pure insight directs the active force of the notion is belief this being a form of pure consciousness like itself and yet opposed to it in that element but at the same time pure insight has a relation to the actual world for like belief it is a return from the actual world into pure consciousness we have first of all to see how its activity is constituted as contrasted with the impure intentions and the perverted forms of insight found in the actual world we have touched already on the placid type of conscious life which stands in contrast to this turmoil of alternate self-dissolution and self-evolution it constitutes the aspect of pure insight and intention this unperturbed consciousness however as we saw has no special insight regarding the sphere of culture the latter has itself rather the most painful feeling and the truest insight about itself the feeling that everything made secure crumbles to pieces that every element of its existence is shattered to atoms and every bone broken moreover it consciously expresses this feeling in words pronounces judgment and gives luminous utterance concerning all aspects of its condition pure insight therefore can have here no activity and content of its own and thus can only take up the formal attitude of truly apprehending this ingenious insight proper to the world and the language it adopts since this language is a scattered and broken utterance and the pronouncement of fickle mood of the moment which is again quickly forgotten and is only known to be a whole by a third consciousness this latter can be distinguished as pure insight only if it gathers those several scattered traces into a universal picture and then makes them the insight of all by this simple means pure insight will resolve the confusion of this world for we have found that the fragments and determinate conceptions and individualities are not the essential nature of this actuality but that it finds its substance and support alone in the spirit which exists qua judging and discussing and that the interest of having a content for this ratiocination and parleying to deal with alone preserves the whole and the fragments into which it falls in this language which insight adopts its self-consciousness is still particular a self existing for its own sake but the emptiness of its content is at the same time emptiness of the self knowing that content to be vain and empty now since the consciousness placidly apprehending all these sparkling utterances of vanity makes a collection of the most striking and penetrating phrases the soul that still preserves the whole the vanity of witty criticism goes to ruin with the other form of vanity the previous vanity of existence the collection shows most people a better wit or at least shows every one a more varied wit than their own and shows that better knowledge and judging in general are something universal and are now universally familiar thereby the single and only interest which was still found is done away with and individual light is resolved into universal insight still however knowledge of essential reality stands secure above vain and empty knowledge and pure insight to begin with appears in genuinely active form in so far as it enters into conflict with belief the struggle of enlightenment with superstition the various negative forms which consciousness adopts the attitude of scepticism and that of theoretical and practical idealism are inferior attitudes compared with that of pure insight and the expansion of pure insight enlightenment for pure insight is born of the substance of spirit it knows the pure self of consciousness to be absolute and enters into conflict with the pure consciousness of the absolute being of all reality since belief and insight are the same pure consciousness but in form are opposed the reality in the case of belief being a thought not a notion and hence something absolutely opposed to self-consciousness while the reality in the case of pure insight is the self they are such that inter se the one is the absolute negative of the other as appearing the one against the other all content falls to belief for in its unperturbed element of thought each moment obtains definite subsistence pure insight however is in the first instance without any content it involves rather the complete disappearance of content 
but by its negative attitude towards what it excludes it will make itself real and give itself a content it knows belief to be opposed to insight opposed to reason and truth just as for it belief is in general a tissue of superstitious prejudices and errors so it further sees the consciousness embracing all this content organized into a realm of error in which false insight is the general sphere of consciousness immediate naively unperturbed and inherently unreflective yet all the while this false insight does have within it the moment of self-reflection the moment of self-consciousness separated from its simple naivete and keeps this reflection in the background as an insight remaining by itself and as an evil intention by which that former conscious state is befooled that mental sphere is the victim of the deception of a priesthood which carries out its envious vanity jealous of being alone in possession of insight and carries out its other selfish ends as well at the same time this priesthood conspires with despotism which takes up the attitude of being the synthetic crude begrifflos unity of the real and this ideal kingdom a singularly amorphous and inconsistent type of being and stands above the bad insight of the multitude and the bad intention of the priests and even combines both of these within itself as the result of the stupidity and confusion produced amongst the people by the agency of priestly deception despotism despises both and draws for itself the advantage of undisturbed control and the fulfilment of its desires its humours and its whims yet at the same time it is itself in this same state of murky insight is equally superstition and error enlightenment does not attack these three forms of the enemy without distinction for since its essential nature is pure insight which is per se universal its true relation to the other extreme is that in which it is concerned with the common and identical element in both the aspect of individual existence isolating itself from a universal naive consciousness is the antithesis of it and cannot be directly affected by it the will of a deceiving priesthood and an oppressive despot is therefore not primarily the object on which it directs its activity its object is the insight that is without will and without individualized isolated self-existence the notion begrief of rational self-consciousness which has its existence in the total mental sphere but is not yet there in the fullness of its true meaning begrief since however pure insight rescues this genuinely honest form of insight with its naive simplicity of nature from prejudices and errors it wrests from the hands of bad intention the effective realization of its powers of deception for the exercise of which the incoherent and undeveloped begrifflos consciousness of the general sphere provides the basis and raw material while isolated self-existence finds its substance in the simple consciousness as a whole the relation of pure insight to the naive consciousness of absolute reality has now a double aspect on one side pure insight is inherently one and the same with it on the other side however this naive consciousness lets absolute reality as well as its parts dispose themselves at will in the simple element of its thought and subsist there and lets them hold only as its inherent nature and hence hold good in objective form in this immanent being it disowns however independent existence for its own sake in so far as according to the first aspect this belief is for pure insight inherently and essentially pure self-consciousness and has to become so expressly merely for itself pure insight finds in this constitutive notion of belief the element in which instead of false insight it realizes itself since from this point of view both are essentially the same and the relation of pure insight takes effect through and in the same element the communication between them is direct and immediate and their give and take an unbroken interfusion whatever pins and bolts may be otherwise driven into consciousness it is in itself the simplicity of nature in which everything is resolved forgotten and unconstrained and which therefore is absolutely amenable to the activity of the notion the communication of pure insight is on that account comparable to a silent extension or the expansion say of vapour in the unresisting atmosphere it is a penetrating infection which did not previously make itself noticeable as something distinct from and opposed to the indifferent medium into which it insinuates its way and hence cannot be averted only when the infection has become widespread is that consciousness alive to it 
which unconcernedly yielded to its influence for what this consciousness received into itself was doubtless something simple homogeneous and uniform throughout it but was at the same time the simplicity of self-reflected negativity which later on also develops by its nature into something opposed and thereby reminds consciousness of its previous state this simple uniformity is the notion which is simple knowledge that knows both itself and its opposite this opposite being however cancelled as opposite within the self-knowledge of the notion in the condition therefore in which consciousness becomes aware of pure insight this insight is already widespread the struggle with it betrays the fact that the infection has done its work the struggle is too late and every means taken merely makes the disease worse for the disease has seized the very marrow of spiritual life that is consciousness in its ultimate principle begrief or its pure inmost nature itself there is therefore no power left in conscious life to surmount the disease because it affects the very inmost being whatever individual expressions remain are repressed and allowed to subside and the superficial symptoms are smothered this is immensely to its advantage for it does not now squander its power in useless fashion nor does it show itself unworthy of its true nature which is the case when it breaks out into symptoms and particular eruptions antithetic to the content of belief and the connection of its external reality rather being now an invisible and unperceived spirit it insinuates its way through and through the noble parts and soon has got complete hold over all the vitals and members of the unconscious idol and then some fine morning it gives its comrade a shove with the elbow when bash crash and the idol is lying on the floor on some fine morning whose noon is not red with blood if the infection has penetrated to every organ of spiritual life it is then the memory alone that still preserves the dead form of the spirit's previous state as a vanished history vanished men know not how and the new serpent of wisdom raised on high before bending worshippers has in this manner painlessly stripped off merely a shrivelled skin but this silent steady working of the loom of spirit in the inner region of its substance its own action hidden from itself is merely one side of the realizing of pure insight its expansion does not only consist in like going along with like and its realization is not merely an unresisted expansion the action of the principle of negation is at the same time essentially a developed process of self-distinction which being a conscious action must set forth its moments in a definitely manifested expression and must make its appearance in the form of sheer noise and a violent struggle with an opposite as such we have therefore to see how pure insight and pure intention maintains its negative attitude towards that other which it finds standing opposed to it pure insight and intention operating negatively can only be since its very principle is all essentiality and there is nothing outside it the negative of itself as insight therefore it passes into the negative of pure insight it becomes untruth and unreason and as intention it passes into the negative of pure intention becomes a lie and sordid impurity of purpose it involves itself in this contradiction by the fact that it engages in a strife and thinks to do battle with some alien external order it merely imagines this for its nature as absolute negativity lies in having that otherness within its own self the absolute notion is the category it is the principle that knowledge and the object of knowledge are the same in consequence what pure insight expresses as its other what it pronounces to be an error or a lie can be nothing else than its own self it can only condemn what itself is what is not rational has no truth or what is not comprehended through a notion conceptually determined is not when reason thus speaks of some other than itself is it in fact speaks merely of itself it does not therein go beyond itself this struggle with the opposite therefore combines in its meaning the significance of being its own actualization this consists just in the process of unfolding its moments and taking them back into itself one part of this process is the making of the distinction in which the insight of reason opposes itself as object to itself so long as it remains in this condition it is at variance with itself qua pure insight it is without any content 
the process of its realization consists in itself becoming content to itself for no other can be made its content because it is the category become self-conscious but since this insight in the first instance thinks of the content as in its opposite and knows the content merely as a content and does not as yet think of it as its own self pure insight misconceives itself in it the complete attainment of insight therefore has the sense of a process of coming to know that content as its own which was to begin with opposed to itself its result however will be thereby neither the re-establishment of the errors it has fought nor merely its original notion but an insight which knows the absolute negation of itself to be its own proper reality to be its self or an insight which is its self-understanding notion this feature of the struggle of enlightenment with errors that of fighting itself in them and of condemning that in them which it asserts this is something for us who observe the process or is what enlightenment and its struggle are in themselves implicitly the first aspect of this struggle however the contamination and defilement of enlightenment through its pure self-identity accepting the attitude and function of destructive negation this is how belief looks upon it belief finds it simply lying unreason and malicious intent just as enlightenment in the same way regards belief as error and prejudice as regards its content it is in the first instance empty insight whose content appears an external other to it it meets this content consequently in the shape of something not yet its own as something that exists quite independent of it and is found in belief enlightenment then conceives its object in the first instance and generally in such a way as to take it as pure insight and failing to recognize itself there interprets it as error in insight as such consciousness apprehends an object in such a manner that it becomes the inner being of conscious life or becomes an object which consciousness permeates in which consciousness maintains itself keeps within itself and is present to itself and by its thus being the process of that object brings the object into being it is precisely this which enlightenment rightly declares belief to be when enlightenment says that the absolute reality professed by belief is a being that comes from belief's own consciousness is its own thought something produced from and by consciousness enlightenment consequently interprets and declares it to be error to be a made-up invention about the very same thing as enlightenment itself is enlightenment that seeks to teach belief this new wisdom does not in doing so tell it anything new for the object of belief itself is just this too that is a pure essential reality of its own peculiar consciousness so that this consciousness does not put itself down for lost and negated in that object but rather puts trust in it and this just means that it finds itself there as this particular consciousness finds itself therein to be self-consciousness if i put my trust in any one his certitude of himself is for me the certitude of myself i know my self-existence in him i know that he acknowledges it and that it is for him both his purpose and his real nature trust however is belief because its consciousness has a direct relation to its object and thus sees at once that it is one with the object and in the object further since what is object for me is something in which i know myself i am at the same time in that object really in the form of another self-consciousness that is one which has become in that object alienated from its own particular individuation from its natural and contingent existence but which partly continues therein to be self-consciousness and partly is there an essential consciousness just like pure insight in the notion of insight there lies not merely this that consciousness knows itself in the object it looks at and finds itself directly there without first quitting the thought element and then returning into itself the notion implies as well that consciousness is aware of itself as being also the mediating process aware of itself as active as the agency of production through this it gets the thought of this unity of self as self and object this very consciousness is also belief obedience and action make a necessary moment through which the certainty of existence in absolute reality comes about this action of belief does not indeed make it appear as if absolute reality is itself produced thereby but the absolute reality for belief is essentially not the abstract reality that lies beyond the believing consciousness 
it is the spirit of the religious communion it is the unity of that abstract reality and self-consciousness the action of the communion is an essential moment in bringing about that it is this spirit of the communion that spirit is what it is by the productive activity of consciousness or rather it does not exist without being produced by consciousness for essential as this process of production is it is as truly not the only basis of absolute reality it is merely a moment the absolute reality is at the same time self-complete and self-contained an und für sich selbst from the other side the notion of pure insight is seen to be something else than its own object for just this negative character constitutes the object thus from the other side it also expresses the ultimate reality of belief as something foreign to self-consciousness something that is not bone of its bone but is surreptitiously foisted on it like a changeling child but here enlightenment is entirely foolish belief discovers it to be a way of speaking which does not know what it is saying and does not understand the facts of the case when it talks about priestly deception and deluding the people it speaks about this as if by means of some hocus-pocus of conjuring priestcraft there were foisted on consciousness as true reality something that is absolutely foreign and absolutely alien to it and yet says all the while that this is an essential reality for consciousness that consciousness believes in it trusts in it and seeks to make it favourably disposed towards itself that is that consciousness therein sees its pure ultimate being just as much as its own particular and universal individuality and creates by its own action this unity of itself with its essential reality in other words it directly declares that to be the very inmost nature of consciousness which it declares to be something alien to consciousness how then can it possibly speak about deception and delusion by the fact that it directly expresses about belief the very opposite of what it asserts of belief it ipso facto really reveals itself to be the transparent lie how are deception and delusion to take place where consciousness in its very truth has directly and immediately the certitude of itself where it possesses itself in its object since it just as much finds as produces itself there the distinction no longer exists even in words when the general question has been raised whether it is permissible to delude a people the answer as a fact had to be that the question is pointless because it is impossible to deceive a people in this matter brass in place of gold counterfeit instead of genuine coin may doubtless have been disposed of in many an instance many a one has stuck to it that a battle lost was a battle won and lies of all sorts about things of sense and particular events have been credited for a time but in the knowledge of that inmost reality where consciousness finds the direct certainty of its own self the idea of delusion is entirely baseless let us see further how belief finds enlightenment in the case of the different moments of its own conscious experience to which the view just noted referred in the first instance only in a general way these moments are a pure thought or qua object absolute being per se an und für sich then its relation as a form of knowledge to absolute being the ultimate basis of its belief and finally its relation to absolute being in its acts that is its and worship service just as pure insight has misconceived itself in belief as a whole and denied its own nature we shall find it taking up in these moments too an attitude similarly perverted and distorted pure insight assumes towards the absolute reality of the believing mind a negative attitude this being is pure thought and pure thought is established within itself as object or as the true being in the believing consciousness this immanent and essential reality of thought preserves at the same time for the self-existent consciousness the form of objectivity but merely the empty form it exists in the character of something consciously presented to pure insight however since it is pure consciousness in its aspect of self existing for itself this other appears as something negative of self-consciousness this might again be taken either as the pure essential reality of thought or even as the being found in sense experience the object of sense certainty but since it is at the same time for the self and this self qua self which has an object is an actual consciousness 
for insight the peculiar object as such is an ordinary existing thing of sense this its object appears before it when it examines the ideas found in belief it condemns these ideas and in doing so condemns its own proper object it really commits a wrong however against belief in so apprehending the object of belief as if it were its own object according to this account it states regarding belief that its absolute being is a piece of stone a block of wood having eyes and seeing not or again some bread paste which is obtained from grain grown on the field and transformed by men and set aside for that purpose or in whatever other ways belief anthropomorphizes absolute being making it objective and representable enlightenment proclaiming itself as the pure and true here turns to what is held to be eternal life and holy spirit into a concrete passing thing of sense and contaminates it with the inherent nothingness of sense experience with an aspect and point of view which is not to be found at all in the worshipping attitude of belief so that enlightenment simply calumniates it by speaking of such an aspect what belief reverses is for belief assuredly neither stone nor wood nor bread dough nor any other sort of thing of time and sense if enlightenment thinks it worth while to say its object all the same is this as well or even that belief is this in its inherent nature and in truth then belief also knows that something which it is as well but for it this something lies outside its worship on the other hand however belief does not in general look on such things as stones etc as having an inherent and essential being at all the absolute reality of pure thought is for it alone something inherent the second moment is the relation of belief as a form of knowing consciousness to this ultimate reality as pure thinking consciousness belief has this reality immediately within itself but pure consciousness is just as much immediate relation of conscious certainty to truth a relation constituting the basis of belief for enlightenment this ground comes at the same time to be regarded as a chance knowledge of chance occurrences the ground of knowledge however is the conscious universal and in its ultimate meaning is absolute spirit which in abstract pure consciousness or thought as such is merely absolute being but qua self-consciousness is the knowledge of itself pure insight sets up this conscious universal self-knowing spirit pure and simple likewise as a negative element for self-consciousness doubtless this insight is itself pure immediate thought that is thought mediating itself with itself it is pure knowledge but since it is pure insight or pure knowledge which does not yet know itself that is for which as yet there is no awareness that it is this pure process of mediation this process seems to insight like everything else constituting it to be something external an other when realizing its inherent principle then it develops this moment essential to it but that moment seems to it to belong to belief and to be in its character of an external other a fortuitous knowledge of just such common historical actualities it thus here charges religious belief with basing its certainty on some particular historical evidence which considered as historical evidence would assuredly not even warrant that degree of certainty about the matter which we get regarding any event mentioned in the newspapers it further makes the imputation that the certainty in the case of religious belief rests on the accidental fact of the preservation of all this evidence on the preservation of this evidence partly by means of paper and partly through the skill and honesty in transferring what is written from one paper to another and lastly rests upon the accurate interpretation of the sense of dead words and letters as a matter of fact however it never occurs to belief to make its certainty depend on such evidence and such fortuitous circumstances belief in its conscious assurance occupies a naive unsophisticated attitude towards its absolute object knows it with a purity which never mixes up letters papers or copyists with its consciousness of the absolute being and does not make use of things of that sort to effect its union with the absolute on the contrary this consciousness is the self-mediating self-relating ground of its knowledge it is spirit itself which bears witness of itself both in the inner heart of the individual consciousness as well as through the presence everywhere and in all men of belief in it 
if belief wants to appeal to historical evidences in order to get also that kind of foundation or at least confirmation for its content which enlightenment speaks of and is really serious in thinking and acting as if that were an important matter then it has eo ipso allowed itself to be corrupted and led astray by the insinuations of enlightenment the efforts it makes to secure a basis or support in this way are merely indications that show how it has been affected and contaminated by enlightenment there still remains the third aspect the active relation of consciousness to absolute being its forms of service this action consists in cancelling the particularity of the individual or the natural form of its self-existence whence arises its certainty of being pure self-consciousness of being as the result of its action that is as a self-existing conscious universal one with ultimate reality since in this action purposiveness and end get distinguished and pure insight likewise takes up a negative attitude towards this action and denies itself just as it did in the other moments it must as regards purposiveness present the appearance of being stupid and unintelligent since insight united with intention accordance of end with means appears to it as an other as really the opposite of what insight is as regards the end however it has to make badness enjoyment and possession its purpose and prove itself in consequence to be the impurest kind of intention since pure intention qua external an other is equally impure intention accordingly we find that so far as concerns purposiveness enlightenment thinks it foolish when the believing individual seeks to obtain the higher consciousness where there is no entanglement with natural enjoyment and pleasure by positively denying itself natural enjoyment and pleasure and proving through its acts that it makes no denial of its contempt for them but rather that the contempt is quite genuine in the same way enlightenment finds it foolish for consciousness to absolve itself of its characteristic of being absolutely individual excluding all others and possessing property of its own by itself demitting its own property for thereby it shows in reality that this isolation is not really serious it shows rather that itself is something that can rise above the natural necessity of isolating itself and of denying in this absolute isolation of its own individual existence that the others are one and the same with itself pure insight finds both purposeless as well as wrong it is purposeless to renounce a pleasure and give away a possession in order to show oneself independent of pleasure and possession hence in the opposite case insight will be obliged to proclaim the man a fool who in order to eat employs the expedient of actually eating insight again thinks it wrong to deny oneself a meal and give away butter and eggs not for money nor money for butter and eggs but just to give them away and get no return at all it understands a meal or the possession of things of that sort to be a self's proper object an end of a self and hence in fact understands itself to be a very impure intention which ascribes essential value to enjoyment and possessions of this kind as pure insight it further maintains the necessity of rising above the condition of nature above covetousness and its ways it only finds it foolish and wrong that this supremacy should have to be demonstrated by action in other words this pure intention is in reality a deception which pretends to and demands an inner elevation but declares that it is superfluous foolish and even wrong to be in earnest in the matter to put this uplifting into concrete expression into actual shape and form and demonstrate its truth pure insight thus denies itself both as pure insight for it abrogates directly purposive action and as pure intention for it denies the intention of proving its independence of the ends of a particular existence thus then enlightenment makes belief learn what it means it takes on this appearance of being bad because just by the fact of relation to an external other it gives itself a negative reality it presents itself as the opposite of itself pure insight and intention have to adopt this relational attitude however for that is their actualization this realization appeared in the first instance as a negative reality perhaps its positive reality is better constituted let us see how this stands <laughs> 
when all prejudice and superstition have been banished the question arises what next what is the truth enlightenment has diffused in their stead it has already given expression to this positive content in its process of exterminating error for that alienation of itself is equally its positive reality in dealing with what for belief is absolute spirit it interprets whatever sort of determination it discovers there as being wood stone etc as particular concrete things of sense since in this way it conceives in general every characteristic that is every content and filling to be a finite fact to be a human entity and a mental presentation absolute being on its own view turns out to be a mere vacuum to which can be attributed no characteristics no predicates at all in fact to marry such a vacuity with universal predicates would be essentially reprehensible and it is just through such a union that the monstrosities of superstition have been produced reason pure insight is doubtless not empty itself since the negative of itself is present consciously to it and is its content it is on the contrary rich in substance but only in particularity and restrictions the enlightened function of reason of pure insight consists in allowing nothing of that sort to appertain to absolute reality nor attributing anything of that kind to it this function well knows how to put itself and the wealth of finitude in their place and deal with the absolute in a worthy manner in contrast with this colourless empty reality there stands as a second aspect of the positive truth of enlightenment the particularity in general of conscious life and of all that is a particularity excluded from an absolute being and standing by itself as something entirely self-contained consciousness which in its very earliest expression is sense certainty and mere opining here comes back after the whole course of its experience to the same point and is once again a knowledge of what is pure negative of itself a knowledge of sense things that is of existent entities which stand in indifference over against its own self-existence but here it is not an immediate naive consciousness it has become to itself immediate while at first the prey to every sort of entanglement into which it is plunged by its gradually unfolding and now led back to its first form by pure insight it has arrived at this first state as the result and outcome of the process this sense certainty resting as it does on an insight into the nothingness of all other forms of consciousness and hence the nothingness of whatever is beyond sense experience this sense certainty is no longer a mere opining it is rather absolute truth this nothingness of everything that transcends sense is doubtless merely a negative proof of this truth but no other is admissible or possible for the positive truth of sense experience in itself is just the unmediated self-existence of the notion itself qua object and an object in the form of otherness the positive truth is that it is absolutely certain to every consciousness that it is and that there are other real things outside it and that in this naive existence it as well as these things too are in and for themselves or absolute lastly the third moment of the truth of enlightenment is the relation of the particular entities to absolute being is the relation of the first two moments to one another insight qua pure insight of what is identical or unrestricted also transcends the unlike or diverse that is transcends finite reality or transcends itself qua mere otherness the beyond of this otherness it takes to be the void to which it thus relates the facts of sense in determining this relation both the terms do not enter the relation as its content for the one is the void and thus a content is only to be had through the other through sense reality the form the relation assumes however to the determination of which the aspect of immanent and ultimate being an sich, contributes can be shaped just as we please for the form is something inherently and essentially negative and therefore something self-opposed being as well as nothing inherent and ultimate an sich, as well as the opposite or what is the same thing the relation of actuality to an inherent essential being qua something beyond is as much a negating as a positing of that actuality finite actualities can therefore properly speaking be taken just in the way people have need of them 
sense facts are thus related now positively to the absolute qua something ultimate an sich and sense reality is itself ultimate per se the absolute makes them fosters and cherishes them then again they are related to it as an opposite that is to their own non-being in this case they are not something ultimate they have being only for an other whereas in the preceding mode of consciousness the conceptions involved in the opposition took shape as good and bad in the case of pure insight they pass into the more abstract form of what is per se an sich and what is for an other being both ways of dealing with the positive as well as the negative relation of finitude to what is ultimate an sich are however equally necessary as a matter of fact and everything is thus as much something per se an sich as it is something for an other in other words everything is useful everything is now at the mercy of other things lets itself now be used by others and exists for them and then again it so to say gets up on its hind legs fights shy of the other exists for itself on its own account and on its side uses the other too from this as a result man being the thing conscious of this relation derives his true nature and place as he is immediately man is good qua natural consciousness per se absolute qua universal and all else exists for him and further since the moments have significance of universality for him qua self-conscious animal everything exists to pleasure and delight him and as he first comes from the hand of god he walks the earth as in a garden planted for him he is bound also to pluck the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil he claims to have a use for it which distinguishes him from every other being for as it happens his inherently good nature is so constituted that the superfluity of delight does it harm or rather his particularity contains as a factor in its constitution a principle that goes beyond it his particularity can overreach itself and destroy itself to prevent this he finds reason a useful means for duly restraining the self-transcendence or rather for preserving himself when he does go beyond determinate limits for such is the force of consciousness the enjoyment of this conscious and essentially universal being must in manifold variety and duration be itself universal and not something determinate the principle of measure or proportion has therefore the determinate function of preventing pleasure in its variety and duration from being quite broken off that is the measure is determined with respect to immoderation as everything is useful for man man is likewise useful too and his characteristic determination consists in making himself a member of the human herd of use for the common good and serviceable to all the extent to which he looks after his own interests is the measure with which he must also serve the purpose of others and so far as he serves their turn he is taking care of himself the one hand washes the other but wherever he finds himself there he is in his right he makes use of others and is himself made use of different things are serviceable to one another in different ways all things however have this reciprocity of utility by their very nature by being related to the absolute in the twofold manner the one positive whereby they have a being all their own the other negative and thereby exist for others the relation of absolute reality or religion is therefore of all forms of profitableness the most supremely profitable for it is profiting pure and simple it is that by which all things stand by which they have a being all their own and that by which all things fall have an existence for something else belief of course finds this positive outcome of enlightenment as much an abomination as its negative attitude towards belief this enlightened insight into absolute reality that sees nothing in it but just absolute reality the être suprême the great void this intention to find that everything in its immediate existence is inherently real an sich or good and finally to find the relation of the particular conscious entity to the absolute being religion exhaustively summed up in the conception of profitableness all this is for belief utterly and simply revolting this special and peculiar wisdom of enlightenment necessarily seems at the same time to the believing mind to be sheer insipidity and the confession of insipidity 
because it consists in knowing nothing of absolute being or what amounts to the same thing in knowing this entirely accurate platitude regarding it that it is merely absolute being and again in knowing nothing but finitude taking this moreover to be the truth and thinking this knowledge about finitude qua truth to be the highest knowledge attainable belief has a divine right as against enlightenment the right of absolute self-identity or of pure thought and it finds itself utterly wronged by enlightenment for enlightenment distorts all its moments and makes them something quite different from what they are in it enlightenment on the other hand has merely a human right as against belief and can only put in a human claim for its own truth for the wrong it commits is the right of disunion of discordance and consists in perverting and altering a right that belongs to the nature of self-consciousness in opposition to the simple ultimate essence or thought but since the right of enlightenment is the right of self-consciousness it will not merely retain its own right too in such a way that two equally valid rights of spirit would be left standing in opposition to one another without either satisfying the claims of the other it will maintain the absolute right because self-consciousness is the negative function of the notion begriff a function which does not merely operate on its own account but also gets control over its opposite and because belief is a mode of consciousness it will not be able to balk enlightenment of that right for enlightenment does not operate against the believing mind with special principles of its own but with those which belief itself implies and contains enlightenment merely brings together and presents to belief its own thoughts the thoughts that lie scattered and apart within belief all unknown to it enlightenment merely reminds belief when one of its own forms is present of others it also has but which it is always forgetting when the one is there enlightenment shows itself to belief to be pure insight by the fact that it in a given determinate moment sees the whole brings forward the opposite element standing in direct relation to that moment and converting the one into the other brings out the principle operating negatively on both thoughts the notion it appears therefore to belief to be distortion and lies because it shows up the other side in the moments of belief enlightenment seems in consequence directly to make something else out of them than they are in their own particularity but this other is equally essential and in reality is to be found in the believing mind itself only the latter does not think about it but keeps it somewhere else hence neither is the result foreign to belief nor can belief reject its truth enlightenment itself however which reminds belief of the opposite of its various separate moments is just as little enlightened regarding its own nature it takes up a purely negative attitude to belief so far as it excludes its own content from its own pure activity and takes that content to be negative of itself consequently neither in this negative in the content of belief does it recognize itself nor for this reason does it bring together the two thoughts the one which it contributes and the one against which it brings the first since it does not know that what it condemns in the case of belief is directly its very own thought it has its own being in the opposition of both moments only one of which that is in every case the one opposed to belief it acknowledges but cuts off the other from the first just as belief does enlightenment consequently does not bring out the unity of both as their unity that is the notion but the notion arises before it and comes to light of its own accord in other words enlightenment finds the notion merely as something lying ready at hand for in itself the process of realizing pure insight is just this that insight whose essential nature is the notion comes before itself to begin with in the shape of an absolute other and repudiates itself for the opposite of the notion is an absolute opposite and then out of this otherness comes to itself or comes to its notion enlightenment however is merely this process it is the activity of the notion in still unconscious form an activity which no doubt comes to itself qua object but takes this object for an external other and does not even know the nature of the notion that is does not know that it is the undifferentiated element which absolutely divides itself as against belief then insight is the power of the notion in so far as this is the active process of relating the moments lying apart from one another in belief 
a way of relating them in which the contradiction in them comes to light herein lies the absolute right of the power which insight exercises over belief but the actuality which it gives this power lies just in the fact that the believing state of consciousness is itself the notion and thus itself recognizes and accepts the opposite which insight produces and presents before it insight therefore has and retains right against belief because it makes valid in belief what is necessary to believe itself and what belief contains within it at first enlightenment asserts the moments of the notion to be an act of consciousness it maintains in the face of belief that the absolute reality belief accepts is a reality of the believer's consciousness qua a self or that this absolute reality is produced through consciousness to the believing mind its absolute being is just as it is in itself for the believer at the same time not as a foreign thing standing there no one knows how or whence it came there the trust and confidence of belief consists just in finding itself in absolute reality as a particular personal consciousness and its obedience and service consist in acting so as to bring out that reality as its own absolute enlightenment strictly speaking only reminds belief of this if belief goes beyond the action of consciousness and gives expression to the ultimate nature an sich, of absolute being in abstracto but while enlightenment no doubt puts alongside the one-sidedness of belief the opposite moment that is the action of belief in contrast to being and being is all belief thinks about here and yet does not itself in doing so bring those opposite thoughts together enlightenment isolates the pure moment of action and declares that what belief takes to be per se ultimate an sich, is merely a product of consciousness the isolated separate act opposed to this ultimate being an sich, is however a contingent action and qua representative activity is a creating of fictions presented figurative ideas that have no being in themselves and this is how enlightenment regards the content of belief conversely however pure insight equally says the very opposite since insight lays stress on the moment of otherness which the notion contains it declares the essential reality for belief to be one which is not in any way due to consciousness is a way beyond consciousness foreign to it and unknown to belief too that reality has the same character on one side belief trusts in it and gets in doing so the assurance of its own self on the other side it is unsearchable in all its ways and unattainable in its being further enlightenment maintains against the believing mind a right which the latter concedes when enlightenment treats the object of the believer's veneration as stone and wood or in short some finite anthropomorphic feature for since this consciousness is divided within itself in having a beyond remote from actuality and an immediate present embodiment in that remote beyond there is also found in it as a matter of fact the view that sense things have a value and significance in and for themselves an und für sich but belief does not bring together these two ideas of what is in and for itself that is that at one time what is in and for itself is for belief pure essential reality and that another time is an ordinary thing of sense even its own pure consciousness is affected by this last view for the distinctions of its supersensuous world because dispensing with the notion are a series of independent shapes and forms and their activity is a happening that is they exist merely in idea merely as presentations and have the characteristic of sense existence enlightenment on its side isolates actuality in the same way treating it as a reality abandoned by spirit isolates specific determinateness as some fixed immovable finite element as if it were not a moment in the spiritual process of the real itself where neither nothing nor something with a being all its own but something evanescent and transitory it is clear that the same is the case with regard to the ground of knowledge the believing mind recognizes itself to be an accidental knowledge for in belief the mind adopts an attitude towards contingencies and absolute reality itself comes before belief in the form of a presented idea of ordinary actual fact consequently belief is also a kind of certainty which does not carry the truth within it and it confesses itself to be an unsubstantial consciousness of this kind 
far short of being well assured of itself and authentically secure this moment however belief forgets in its immediate spiritual knowledge of absolute reality enlightenment however which reminds belief of all this thinks again merely of the contingency of the knowledge and forgets the other thinks only of the mediating process which takes effect through an alien third term and does not think on that process wherein the immediate self is itself the third term through which it mediates itself with the other that is with itself finally on the view enlightenment takes of the action of belief the rejection of enjoyment and possessions is looked upon as wrong and purposeless as to the wrong thus done enlightenment preserves the harmony of the believing attitude in this that belief acknowledges the actual reality of possessing property keeping hold of it and enjoying it in insisting on its property it behaves with all the more stubborn independence and exclusiveness and in its enjoyment with all the more frank self-abandonment since its religious act of giving up pleasure and property takes effect beyond the region of this actuality and purchases for it freedom to do as it likes so far as that other sphere is concerned this service that consists in sacrificing natural impulses and enjoyments in point of fact has no truth owing to this opposition the retention and the sacrifice subsist together side by side the sacrifice is merely a sign which performs real sacrifice only as regards a small part and hence in point of fact only representatively suggests sacrifice as for purposiveness enlightenment finds it pointless and stupid to throw away a possession in order to feel and to prove oneself to be free from all possession to renounce an enjoyment in order to think and demonstrate that one is rid of all enjoyment the believing mind itself takes the absolute act for a universal one not only does the action of its absolute reality as its object appear something universal but the individual consciousness too has to prove itself detached entirely and altogether from its sensuous nature but throwing away a particular possession giving up and disclaiming a particular enjoyment is not acting universally in this way and since in the action it is essentially the purpose which is a universal and the performance which is a particular process that had to stand in order incompatibility before consciousness that action shows itself to be of a kind in which consciousness has no share and consequently this way of acting is seen to be too naive to be an action at all it is too naive to fast in order to prove oneself quite indifferent to the pleasures of the table too naive to rid oneself like origin of other bodily pleasure in order to show that pleasure is finished and done with the act itself proves to be an external and a particular function but desire is deeply rooted within the inner life and is a universal element its pleasure neither disappears with the instrument for getting pleasure nor by abstention from particular pleasures but enlightenment on its side here isolates the unrealized inwardness as against the concrete actuality just as in the case of the devotion and direct intuition of belief enlightenment holds fast to the externality of things of sense as against the inward attitude of belief enlightenment finds the main point in the intention in the thought and thereby finds no need for actually bringing about the liberation from natural ends on the contrary this inner sphere is itself the formal element that has its concrete fulfilment in natural impulses which are justified simply by the fact that they fall within that they belong to universal being to nature enlightenment then holds irresistible sway over belief by the fact that the latter finds in its own constitution the very moments to which enlightenment gives significance and validity looking more closely at the action exerted by this force its operation on belief seems to rend asunder the unity and happy harmony of trustfulness and immediate confidence to pollute its spiritual life with lower thoughts drawn from the sphere of sense to destroy the feeling of calm security in its attitude of submission by introducing the vanity of understanding of self-will and self-fulfilment but in point of fact enlightenment rarely brings to pass the abolition of that state of unthinking or rather uncomprehended begrifflos cleavage which finds a place in the nature of belief the believing mood weighs and measures by a twofold standard it has two sorts of eyes and ears uses two voices to express its meaning 
it duplicates all ideas without comparing and squaring the sense and meaning in the two forms used or we may say belief lives its life amidst two sorts of perceptions the one the perceptions of thought which is asleep purely uncritical and uncomprehending the other those of waking consciousness living solely and simply in a world of sense and in each of them it manages to carry on a household all its own enlightenment illuminates that world of heaven with ideas drawn from the world of sense pointing out there this element of finitude which belief cannot deny or repudiate because it is self-consciousness and in being so is the unity to which both kinds of ideas belong and in which they do not fall apart from one another for they belong to the same indivisible simple self into which belief has passed and which constitutes its life belief has by this means lost the content which furnished its filling and collapses into an inarticulate state where the spirit works and weaves within itself belief is banished from its own kingdom this kingdom is sacked and plundered since every distinction and expansion of it has rent the waking consciousness in its innermost nature and claimed every one of its parts for earth and returned them to the earth that owns them yet belief is not on that account satisfied for this illumination has everywhere brought to light only what is individual with the result that only insubstantial realities and finitude forsaken of spirit make any appeal to spirit since belief is without content and cannot continue in this barren condition or since in getting beyond finitude which is the sole content it finds merely the empty void it is a sheer longing its truth is an empty beyond for which there is no longer any appropriate content to be found for everything is appropriated and connected in other ways belief in this manner has in fact become the same as enlightenment the conscious attitude of relating a finite that inherently exists to an unknown and unknowable absolute without predicates the difference is merely that the one is enlightenment satisfied while belief is enlightenment unsatisfied it will yet be seen whether enlightenment can continue in its state of satisfaction that longing of the troubled beshadowed spirit mourning over the loss of its spiritual world lies in the background enlightenment has on it this stain of unsatisfied longing in its empty absolute being we find this in the form of the pure object in passing beyond its individual nature to an unfulfilled beyond the flick appears as an act and a process in the selflessness of what is useful it is seen in the form of an object fulfilled enlightenment will remove this stain by considering more closely the positive result which constitutes the truth in its case we shall find that the stain is implicitly removed already end of section ten section eleven of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six b part two b the true result of enlightenment the spirit that sullenly works and weaves without further distinctions within itself has thus passed into itself away beyond consciousness which again has arrived at clearness as to itself the first moment of this clearness of mind is determined in regard to its necessity and constitution by the fact that pure insight or insight that is implicitly and per se notion actualizes itself it does so when it gives otherness or determinateness a place in its own nature in this manner it is negative pure insight that is the negation of the notion this negation is equally pure and herewith has arisen the pure and simple thing the absolute being that has no further determination of any sort if we define this more precisely insight in the sense of absolute notion is a distinguishing of distinctions that are not so any longer of abstractions or pure notions that no longer support themselves but find a fixed hold and a distinction only by means of the whole life of the process this distinguishing of what is not distinguished consists just in the fact that the absolute notion makes itself its object and as against that process asserts itself to be the essence the essence hereby dispenses with the aspect wherein abstractions or distinctions are kept apart 
and hence becomes pure thought in the sense of a pure thing this now is just a dull silent unconscious working and weaving of the spirit at the loom of its own being to which belief as we saw sank back when it lost all distinction in its content and this is at the same time that movement of pure self-consciousness in regard to which the essence is intended to be the absolutely external beyond for because this pure self-consciousness is a movement working with pure notions with distinctions that are no distinctions pure self-consciousness collapses in fact into that unconscious working and weaving of spirit that is into pure feeling or pure thinghood the self-alienated notion for the notion still stands here at the level of such alienation does not however know this identical nature constituting both sides the movement of self-consciousness and its absolute reality does not know the identity of their nature which in point of fact gives them their very substance and subsistence since the notion is not aware of this insight absolute reality has significance and value merely in the form of an objective beyond while the consciousness making these distinctions and in this way keeping the ultimate reality outside itself is treated as a finite consciousness regarding that absolute being enlightenment itself falls out with itself in the same way as it did formerly with belief and is divided between the views of two parties one party proves itself to be victorious by the fact that it breaks up into two parties for in that fact it shows it possesses within it the principle it combats and consequently shows it has abolished the one-sidedness with which it formerly made its appearance the interest which was divided between it and the other now falls entirely within it and forgets the other because that interest finds lying in it alone the opposition on which attention is directed at the same time however the opposition has been lifted into the higher victorious element where it is cleared up and set forth so that the schism that arises in one party and seems a misfortune demonstrates rather its good fortune the pure essence itself has in it no distinction consequently distinction is reached by two such pure essences being put forward for consciousness to be aware of or by a twofold consciousness of the pure reality the pure absolute essence is only in pure thought or rather it is pure thought itself and thus absolutely beyond the finite beyond self-consciousness and is merely the ultimate essence in a negative sense but in this way it is just being the negative of self-consciousness being negative of self-consciousness it is also related to self-consciousness it is external being which placed in relation to self-consciousness within which distinctions and determinations fall preserves within it the distinctions of being tasted seen and so on and the relationship is that of sense experience and perception taking the point of departure from this sense existence into which that negative beyond necessarily passes but abstracting from those various ways in which consciousness is related to sense existence there is left pure matter as that in which consciousness weaves and moves inarticulately within itself in dealing with this the essential point to note is that pure matter is merely what remains over when we abstract from seeing feeling tasting etc that is it is not what is seen tasted felt and so on it is not matter that is seen felt or tasted but colour a stone salt and so on matter is really a pure abstraction and being so we have here the pure essential nature of thought or pure thought itself as the absolute without predicates undetermined having no distinctions within it the one kind of enlightenment calls absolute being that predicateless absolute which exists in thought beyond the actual consciousness from which this enlightenment started the other calls it matter if they were distinguished as nature and spirit or god the unconscious inner working and weaving would have nothing of the wealth of developed life required in order to be nature while spirit or god would have no self-distinguishing consciousness both as we saw are entirely the same notion the distinction lies not in the objective fact but purely in the diversity of starting point adopted by the two thought constructions and in the fact that each keeps to a special point of view in the thought process if they rose above that their thoughts would coincide and they would find what to the one is as it holds a horror and to the other a folly is one and the same thing for to the one absolute being in its pure thought or directly for pure consciousness 
is outside finite consciousness is the negative beyond of finite mind if it would reflect that in part that simple immediacy of thought is nothing else than pure being that in part again what is negative for consciousness is at the same time related to consciousness that in the negative judgment the copula is also connects and holds together the two separated factors it would come to see that this beyond which the nature of an external existence implies stands in a relation to consciousness and that in so doing this means the same as what is called pure matter the missing moment of the present would then be secured the other enlightenment starts from sense existence it then abstracts from the sensuous relation of tasting seeing etc and turns sense existence into purely inherent being an sich, absolute matter something neither felt nor heard this being has in this way become the inner reality of pure consciousness the ultimately simple without predicates it is the pure notion qua notion whose being is in itself or it is pure thought within itself this insight in its conscious activity does not go through the process of passing from being which is purely being to an opposite in thought which is the same as mere being or does not go from the pure positive to the opposite pure negative since the positive is really pure simply and solely through negation while the negative qua pure is self-identical and one within itself and precisely on that account positive or again these two have not come to the notion found in descartes's metaphysics that in themselves being and thought are the same they have not arrived at the thought that being pure being is not a concrete actual reality but pure abstraction and conversely that pure thought self-identity or inner essence is partly the negative of self-consciousness and consequently is being and partly qua immediate simple entity is likewise nothing else than being thought is thinghood or thinghood is thought the real essence is here divided asunder in such a way that to begin with it appertains to two specifically distinct modes of thinking in part the real must hold distinction in itself in part just by so doing both ways of considering it merge into one for then the abstract moments of pure being and the negative by which their distinction is expressed are united in the object with which these modes of treatment deal the universal common to both is the abstraction of pure self-thinking of pure quivering within the self this simple notion of rotating on its own axis is bound to resolve itself into separate moments because it is itself only motion by distinguishing its own moments this distinguishing of the moments leaves the unmoved unity behind as the empty shell of pure being that is no longer actual thought has no more life within it for qua distinction this process is all the content the process which thus puts itself outside that unity thereby constitutes however the shifting change a change that does not return into itself of the moments of being in itself of being for another and of being for self actual reality in the way this is object for the concrete consciousness of pure insight constitutes utility bad as utility may look to belief or sentimentality or even to the abstraction that calls itself speculation and takes to deal with the ultimate the inherent nature yet it is that in which pure insight finds its realization and itself is the object for insight an object which insight now no longer repudiates and which too it does not put down as the void or the pure beyond for pure insight as we saw is the living notion itself the self-same pure personality distinguishing itself within itself in such a way that each of the distinguished elements is itself pure notion that is is eo ipso not distinct it is simple undifferentiated pure self-consciousness which is for itself as well as in itself within an immediate unity its inherent being its being in itself is therefore not fixed and permanent but at once ceases in its distinction to be something distinctive a being of that kind however which is immediately without support and cannot stand of itself has no being in itself no inherent existence it is essentially for something else which is the power that consumes and absorbs it but the second moment opposed to that first one disappears immediately too like the first or rather qua being merely for some other 
it is the very process of disappearing and is definitely affirmed as being that has turned back into itself as being for itself this simple being for self however qua self-identity is rather an objective being or is thereby for an other this nature of pure insight in thus unfolding and making explicit its moments in other words insight qua object finds expression in the useful the profitable what is useful is a thing something that subsists in itself this being in itself is at the same time only a pure moment it is in consequence absolutely for something else but is equally for an other merely as it is in itself these opposite moments return into the indivisible unity of being for self while however the useful doubtless expresses the notion of pure insight it is all the same not insight as such but insight as conscious presentation or as object for insight it is merely the restless shifting change of those moments of which one is indeed being returned into itself but merely as being for itself that is as abstract moment appearing on one side over against the others the useful itself does not consist in the negative fact of having these moments in their opposition at the same time undivided in one and the same respect of having them a form of thought per se in the way they are qua pure insight the moment of being for self is doubtless a phase of usefulness but not in the sense that it swamps the other moments being per se and being for another if so it would be the whole self in dealing with the useful pure insight thus takes as object its own peculiar notion in the pure moments constituting its nature it is the consciousness of this metaphysical principle but not yet its conceptual comprehension it has not yet itself got to the unity of being and notion because the useful still appears before insight in the form of an object insight has a world not indeed any longer a world all by itself and self-contained but still a world all the same which it distinguishes from itself only since the opposites have come forth on the summit of the notion the next step will be for them to collide with one another and for enlightenment to experience the fruits of their deeds when we look at the object reached in relation to this entire sphere of spiritual life we found the actual world of culture summed up in the vanity of self-consciousness in independent self-existence whose content is drawn from the confusion characteristic of culture and which is still the individual notion not yet the self-conscious für sich universal notion returned into itself however that individual notion is pure insight pure consciousness qua pure self or negativity just as belief too is pure consciousness qua pure thought or positivity belief finds in that self the moment that makes it complete but perishing through being thus completed it is in pure insight that we now see both moments as absolute being which is purely thought constituted or is a negative entity and as matter which is the positive entity this completion still lacks that actual reality of self-consciousness which belongs to the vain and empty type of consciousness the world out of which thought raised itself up to itself what is thus wanting is reached in the aspect of utility so far as pure insight secures positive objectivity there pure insight is thereby a concrete actual consciousness satisfied within itself this objectivity now constitutes its world and is become the final and true outcome of the entire previous world ideal as well as real the first world of spirit is the expansive realm of spirit's self-dispersed existence and of certainty of self in separate individual shapes and forms just as nature disperses its life in an endless multiplicity of forms and shapes without the generic principle of all the forms being present therein the second world contains the generic principle and is the realm of the ultimate inherent nature ansichseins or the essential truth over against that individual certainty the third world however that of the profitable or the useful is the truth which is certainty of self as well the realm of the truth of belief lacks the principle of concrete actuality or of certainty of self in the sense of this individual self but again concrete actuality or certainty of self qua this individual lacks the ultimate inherent nature an sich in the object of pure insight both worlds are united 
the useful is the object so far as self-consciousness sees through it and individual certainty of self finds its enjoyment its self-existence in it self-consciousness sees into it in this manner and this insight contains the true essence of the object which consists in being something permeable to sight something seen through in other words in being for another this insight is thus itself true knowledge and self-consciousness directly finds in this attitude universal certainty of itself as well has its pure consciousness in this attitude in which truth as well as immediateness and actuality are united both worlds are reconciled and heaven is transplanted to the earth below end of section eleven section twelve of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six b part three absolute freedom and terror consciousness has found its notion in the principle of utility but that notion is partly an object still partly for that very reason still a purpose of which consciousness does not yet find itself to be immediately possessed utility or profitableness is still a predicate of the object not a subject not its immediate and sole actuality it is the same thing that appeared before when we found that self-existence being for self had not yet shown itself to be the substance of the remaining moments a process by which the useful would be primarily nothing else than the self of consciousness and this latter thereby in its possession this resumption of the form of objectivity which characterizes the useful has however already taken effect implicitly and as the outcome of this immanent internal revolution there comes to light the actual revolution of concrete actuality the new mode of conscious life absolute freedom this is so because in point of fact there is here no more than an empty semblance of objectivity separating self-consciousness from actual possession for in part all the worth and permanence of the various specific members of the organization of the world of actuality and belief have as a whole returned into this simple determination which is their ground and their indwelling spirit in part however this determinate element has nothing peculiarly its own left for itself it is instead pure metaphysic pure notion or knowledge of self-consciousness that is to say from the inherent and specific nature of the useful qua object consciousness learns that its inherent nature its being in itself is essentially a being for another mere being per se since it is selfless is ultimately and in truth a passive entity or something that is for another self the object however is present to consciousness in this abstract form of purely immanent being of pure being in itself for consciousness is the activity of pure insight the separate moments of which take the pure form of notions self-existence being for self however into which being for another returns in other words the self is not a self of what is called object a self all its own and different from the ego for consciousness qua pure insight is not an individual self over against which the object in the sense of having a self all its own could stand but the pure notion the gazing of the self into self the literal and absolute seeing itself doubled the certainty of itself is the universal subject and its notion knowing itself is the essential being of all reality if the useful was merely the shifting change of the moments without returning into its own proper unity and was hence still an object for knowledge to deal with then it ceases to be this now for knowing is itself the process and movement of those abstract moments it is the universal self the self of itself as well as of the object and being universal is the unity of this process a unity that returns into itself this brings on the seen spirit in the form of absolute freedom it is the mode of self-consciousness which clearly comprehends that in its certainty of self lies the essence of all the component spiritual parts of the concrete sensible as well as of the supersensible world or conversely that essential being and concrete actuality consist in the knowledge consciousness has of itself it is conscious of its pure personality and with that of all spiritual reality and all reality is solely spirituality 
the world is for it absolutely its own will and this will is universal will and further this will is not the empty thought of will which is constituted by giving a silent assent or an assent through a representative a mere symbol of willing it is a concretely embodied universal will the will of all individuals as such for will is in itself the consciousness of personality of every single one and it has to be as this true concrete actual will as self-conscious essential being of each and every personality so that each single and undivided does everything and what appears as done by the whole is at once and consciously the deed of every single individual this undivided substance of absolute freedom puts itself on the throne of the world without any power being able to offer effectual resistance for since in very truth consciousness is alone the element which furnishes spiritual beings or powers with their substance their entire system which is organized and maintained through division into separate spheres and distinct wholes has collapsed into a single whole when once the individual consciousness conceives the object as having no other nature than that of self-consciousness itself or conceives it to be absolutely the notion what made the notion an existential object was the distinguishing it into separate and separately subsisting areas or groups when however the object becomes a notion there is nothing fixedly subsisting left in it negativity permeates and pervades all its moments it exists in such a way that each individual consciousness rises out of the sphere assigned to it finds no longer its inmost nature and function in this isolated area but grasps itself as the notion of will grasps all the various groupings as the essential expression of this will and is in consequence only able to realize itself in a work which is a work of the whole in this absolute freedom all social ranks or classes which are the component spiritual factors into which the whole is differentiated are effaced and annulled the individual consciousness that belonged to any such group and exercised its will and found its fulfilment there has removed the barriers confining it its purpose is the universal purpose its language universal law its work universal achievement the object and the element distinguished have here lost the meaning of utility of profitableness which was a predicate of all real being consciousness does not commence its process with the object as a sort of alien element after dealing with which it then and only then returns into itself the object it is aware of is consciousness itself the opposition thus consists solely in the distinction of individual and universal consciousness but the individual itself is directly on its own view that which had merely the semblance of opposition it is universal consciousness and will the ulterior beyond that lies remote from this its actual reality hovers over the corpse of the vanished and departed independence of what is real or believed to be and hovers there merely as an exhalation of stale gas of the empty être supreme by doing away with the various distinct spiritual groups and the restricted and confined life of individuals as well as both its worlds there thus remains merely the process of the universal self-consciousness within itself as an interaction of its content a reciprocal interaction between its universal form and personal consciousness the universal will goes into itself is subjectivized and becomes individual will to which the universal law and universal work stand opposed but this individual consciousness is equally and immediately conscious of itself as universal will it is fully aware that its own objective content is a law given by that will a work performed by that will in exercising and carrying out its activity in creating objectivity it is thus doing nothing individual but executing laws and functions of the state this process is consequently the interaction of consciousness with itself in which it lets nothing break away and assume the shape of a detached object standing over against it it follows from this that it cannot arrive at a positive accomplishment of anything either in the way of universal operations in language or in actual reality either in the shape of laws and universal regulations of conscious freedom or of deeds and works of active freedom the accomplished result of which this freedom that gives itself consciousness might manage to arrive would consist in the fact that such freedom qua universal substance made itself into an object and an abiding existence this objective otherness would there be the differentiation which enabled it to divide itself into stable spiritual groups and into separate fragments or members 
these wholes or spheres would partly be the thought-constituted factors of a power that is differentiated into legislative judicial and executive but partly they would be the substantial elements we found in the real world of spiritual culture and since the content of universal action would be more closely taken note of they would be the particular areas or spheres of labour which are further distinguished as specific social ranks or classes universal freedom which would have differentiated itself in this manner into its various parts and by the very fact of doing so would have made itself an existing substance would thereby be free from particular individualities and could apportion the plurality of individuals to its several parts the activity and being of personality would however find itself by this process confined to a branch of the whole to one kind of action and existence when placed in the element of existence personality would bear the meaning of a determinate personality it would cease to be in reality universal self-consciousness neither by the idea of submission to self-imposed laws addressed in part to universal self-consciousness nor by its being represented when legislation and universal action take place the self-consciousness here let itself be mistaken about the actual truth that itself lays down the law and itself accomplishes a universal and not a particular task for in the case where the self is merely represented and ideally presented volkestelt there it is not actual where it is by proxy it is not just as the individual self-consciousness does not find itself in this universal work of absolute freedom qua existing substance as little does it find itself in the deeds proper and specific individual acts of will performed by this substance for the universal to pass into a deed it must gather itself into the single unity of individuality and put an individual consciousness in the forefront for universal will is an actual concrete will only in a self that is single and one thereby however all other individuals are excluded from the entirety of this deed and have only a restricted share in it so that the deed would not be a deed of real universal self-consciousness universal freedom can thus produce neither a positive achievement nor a deed there is left for it only negative action it is merely the rage and fury of disappearance and destruction but the highest reality of all and the reality most of all opposed to absolute freedom or rather the sole object it is yet to become aware of is the freedom and singleness of actual self-consciousness itself for that universality which does not let itself attain the reality of organic differentiation and whose purpose it is to maintain itself in unbroken continuity distinguishes itself within itself all the while because it is process or consciousness in general moreover on account of its own peculiar abstraction it divides itself into extremes equally abstract into the cold unbending bare universality and the hard discrete absolute rigidity and stubborn atomic singleness of actual self-consciousness now that it is done with exterminating and destroying express organization and subsists on its own behalf this is its sole object an object that has no other content left no other possession existence and external extension but is merely this knowledge of itself as absolutely pure and detached individual self the point at which the object can be laid hold of and understood is solely its abstract existence in general the relation then of these two since they exist for themselves indivisibly and absolutely and thus cannot arrange for a common part to act as a means for connecting them is pure negation entirely devoid of mediation the negation moreover of the individual as a factor existing within the universal the sole and only work indeed accomplished by universal freedom is therefore death a death that achieves nothing embraces nothing within its grasp for what is negated is the unachieved unfulfilled punctual entity of the absolutely free self it is thus the most cold-blooded mean and meaningless death of all with no more significance than cleaving a head of cabbage or swallowing a draught of water in this single expressionless syllable consists the wisdom of the government the intelligence of the general will when carrying out and executing its plans the government is itself nothing but the self-established focus the individual embodiment of the general will government a power to will and perform proceeding from a single centre wills and performs at the same time a determinate order and action in doing so it on the one hand excludes other individuals from a share in its deed and on the other 
thereby constitutes itself a form of government which is a specifically determinate will and eo ipso opposed to the universal will by no manner of means therefore can it put itself forward as anything but a faction the victorious faction only is called the government and just in that it is a faction lies the direct necessity of its overthrow and its being government makes it conversely into a faction and hence guilty when the universal will holds to this concrete action of the government and holds this to be a crime which the government has committed against the universal will then the government on its side has nothing tangible and external left whereby to establish and show the guilt of the will opposing itself to it for what thus stands opposed to it as concrete actual universal will is merely unreal abstract will bare intention being suspected therefore takes the place or has the significance and effect of being guilty and the external reaction against this reality that lies in bare inward intention consists in the fatuous barren destruction of this particular existent self in whose case there is nothing else to take away but its mere existence in this its characteristically peculiar performance absolute freedom becomes objective to itself and self-consciousness finds out what this freedom is in itself it is just this abstract self-consciousness which destroys all distinction and all fixedness of distinction within itself it is object to itself in this shape the terror of death is the direct apprehension anschauung, of this its negative nature this its reality however finds absolute free self-consciousness quite different from what its own notion of itself was that is that the universal will is merely the positive substance of personality and that this latter knows itself in it only positively knows itself preserved there rather for this self-consciousness which qua pure insight completely separates its positive and negative nature separates the unpredicated absolute qua pure thought and qua pure matter the absolute transition from the one to the other is found here present within its reality the universal will qua absolutely positive concrete self-consciousness because it is this self-conscious actuality raised to the level of pure thought or abstract matter turns round into the negative entity and shows itself at the same time to be what cancels and does away with self-thinking or self-consciousness absolute freedom qua pure self-identity of universal will thus carries with it negation but in doing so contains distinction in general and develops this again as concrete actual difference for pure negativity finds in the self-identical universal will the element of subsistence or the substance in which its moments get their realization it has the matter which it can turn into the specific nature of the substance and in so far as this substance has manifested itself to be the negative element for the individual consciousness the organization of the spiritual groups or masses of the substance to which the plurality of conscious individuals is assigned thus takes shape and form once more these individuals who felt the fear of death their absolute lord and master submit to negation and distinction once more arrange themselves into groups and return to a restricted and apportioned task but thereby to their substantial reality out of this tumult spirit would be thrown back upon its starting point the ethical world and the real world of spiritual culture which would thus have been merely refreshed and rejuvenated by the fear of the lord that has again entered their hearts spirit would have anew to traverse and continually repeat this cycle of necessity if only complete interpenetration of self-consciousness and the substance were the final result in such an interpenetration self-consciousness might seek to experience the force of its universal nature operating negatively upon it would try to know and find itself not as this particular self-consciousness but only as universal and hence too would be able to endure the objective reality of universal spirit a reality excluding self-consciousness qua particular but this is not the form the final result assumes for in absolute freedom there was no reciprocal interaction either between an external world and consciousness which is absorbed in manifold existence or sets itself determinate purposes and ideas or between consciousness and an external objective world be it a world of reality or of thought what that freedom contained was the world absolutely in the form of consciousness as a universal will and along with that self-consciousness gathered out of all the dispersion and manifoldness of existence or all the manifold ends and judgments of mind 
and concentrate it into the bare and simple self the form of culture which it attains in interaction with that essential nature is therefore the grandest and the last is that seeing its pure and simple reality immediately disappear and pass away into empty nothingness in the sphere of culture itself it does not get the length of viewing its negation or alienation in this form of pure abstraction its negation is negation with a filling and a content either honour and wealth which it gains in the place of the self that it has alienated from itself or the language of esprit and insight which the distraught consciousness acquires or again the negation is the heaven of belief or the element of utility belonging to the stage of enlightenment all these determinate elements disappear with the disaster and ruin that overtake the self in the state of absolute freedom its negation is meaningless death sheer horror of the negative which has nothing positive in it nothing that gives a filling at the same time however this negation in its actual manifestation is not something alien and external it is neither that universal background of necessity in which the moral world is swamped nor the particular accident of private possession the whims and humours of the owner on which the distraught consciousness finds itself dependent it is universal will which in this its last abstraction has nothing positive and hence can give nothing in return for the sacrifice but just on that account this will is in unmediated oneness with self-consciousness it is the pure positive because it is the pure negative and that meaningless death the insubstantial vacuous negativity of self in its inner constitutive principle turns round into absolute positivity for consciousness the immediate unity of itself with universal will its demand to see and find itself as a determinate particular focus in the universal will is changed and converted into the absolutely opposite experience what it loses there is abstract being the immediate existence of that insubstantial focus and this vanished immediacy is the universal will as such which it now knows itself to be so far as it is superseded and cancelled immediacy so far as it is pure knowledge or pure will by this means it knows that will to be itself and knows itself to be essential reality but not as the immediate essence not will as revolutionary government or anarchy struggling to establish an anarchical constitution nor itself as a centre of this faction or the opposite the universal will is its pure knowing and willing and it is universal will qua this pure knowledge and volition it does not lose itself there for pure knowledge and volition is it qua atomic point of consciousness it is thus the interaction of pure knowledge with itself pure knowledge qua essential reality is universal will while this essence is simply and solely pure knowledge self-consciousness is thus pure knowledge of essential reality in the sense of pure knowledge furthermore qua particular self it is merely the form of the subject or concrete real action a form which by it is known as form in the same way objective reality being is for it absolutely selfless form for that objective reality would be what is not known this knowledge however knows knowledge to be the essential fact absolute freedom has thus squared and balanced the opposition of universal and particular will with its own nature the self-alienated type of mind driven to the acme of its opposition where pure volition and the purely volitional agent are still kept distinct reduces that opposition to a transparent form and therein finds itself just as the realm of the real and actual world passes over into that of belief and insight absolute freedom leaves its self-destructive sphere of reality and passes over into another land of self-conscious spirit where in this unreality freedom is taken to be and is accepted as the truth in the thought of this truth spirit refreshes and revives itself so far as spirit is thought and remains so and knows this being which self-consciousness involves that is thought to be the complete and entire essence of everything the new form and mode of experience that now arises is that of the moral life of spirit end of section twelve section thirteen of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone
chapter six c spirit in the condition of being certain of itself morality translator's note the following section deals with the final and highest stage in the life of finite spiritual experience as realized in the concrete form of a historical society here the substance of the social order is the real content of the self-conscious individual that substance has become subjectified we have therefore a self-contained spiritual subject the discordance involved in the sphere of culture and enlightenment is overcome by the self-knowing and realizing itself as a complete universal self-determining free will its world within itself and itself its own world each reflects the whole the totality of social life in itself so perfectly that what it does is transparently the doing of the whole as much as its own doing such a sphere of spiritual existence is morality the all-sufficient spiritual order of the finite spirit as an individual the meaning assigned to morality here is that expressed by kant when he says that morality is the relation of actions to the autonomy of the will that is to possible universal legislation through maxims of the will in other words all the universality constituting the interrelations of finite spirits in a society are epitomized in the soul of the acting individual who can thus quite legitimately look upon itself as the self-regulating source of all universal conditions of action it is inevitable that such a concrete mode of experience should have various aspects and should pass through various stages in the process of fully realizing its nature the individual may lay exclusive stress on the self-completeness which he possesses through being the source and origin of his own laws his self-legislative function just because it carries with it the sense of universality may appear so supremely important that all the actual detail of his life comes to be treated as external indifferent and contingent this detail no doubt is essential to give body and substance to his spiritual individuality but the universality of his will so far transcends each and every detail of content as to be seen by itself the sole and all-sufficient reality of his being the content of his life only enters into consideration as an element to be regulated and made to conform to the universal the relation so constituted between content and universal is found in the consciousness of duty since the content is thus subordinate though absolutely essential to give even meaning to the idea and the fulfilment of duty and since the universal is the supremely important fact not merely is duty to be fulfilled for duty's sake but the duty in question is pure duty the good will is the purely universal will and is the only will in the world from this point of view in the first section a hegel analyzes this phase of the moral life the historical material the writer has in mind is a moral attitude which came into prominence at the time of the romantic movement towards the end of the eighteenth and the beginning of the nineteenth century it found its philosophical expression in the moral theories of kant and fichte and lessing may be taken as a typical representative in literature of the same attitude end of translator's note spirit in the condition of being certain of itself morality the ethical order of the community found its consummation and its truth in the type of spirit existing in mere solitude and separation within it the individual self this legal person however has its substance and its fulfilment outside that ethical order the process of the world of culture and belief does away with this abstraction of a mere person and by the completion of the process of estrangement by reaching the extremity of abstraction the self of spirit finds the substance become first the universal will and finally its own possession here then knowledge seems at last to have become entirely at one with the truth at which it aims for its truth is this knowledge itself all opposition between the two sides has vanished and that too not for us who are tracing the process not merely implicitly but actually for self-consciousness itself that is to say knowledge has itself got the mastery over the opposition which consciousness had to face this rests on the opposition between certainty of self and the object 
now however the object for it is the certainty of self knowledge just as the certainty of itself as such has no longer ends of its own is no longer conditioned and determinate but is pure knowledge self-consciousness thus now takes the knowledge of itself to be the substance itself this substance is for it at once immediate and absolutely mediated in one indivisible unity it is immediate just in the way the ethical consciousness knows and itself does its duties and is bound to the substance as to its own nature but it is not character just as that ethical consciousness which in virtue of its immediacy is a determinate type of spirit belongs merely to one of the essential features of ethical life and has the peculiarity of not being conscious explicit knowledge it is again absolute mediation as involving the conscious processes of culture and belief for it is essentially the movement of the life of self to transcend the abstract form of immediate existence and become consciously universal and yet to do so neither by simply estranging and rending itself as well as reality nor by fleeing from it rather it is directly and immediately present in its very substance for this substance is its knowledge it is the pure certainty of self becoming transparently visible and just this very immediacy which constitutes its actual reality is the entire actuality for the immediate is being and qua pure immediacy immediacy made transparent by thoroughgoing negation this immediacy is pure being is being in general is all being absolute essential being is therefore not exhausted by the characteristic of being the simple essence of thought it is all actuality and this actuality exists merely as knowledge what consciousness did not know would have no sense and can be no power in its life into its self-conscious knowing will all objectivity the whole world has withdrawn it is absolutely free in that it knows its freedom and just this very knowledge of its freedom is its substance its purpose its sole and only content end of section thirteen